welcome everybody and I'm really thrilled to welcome these some fantastic panelists as part of Washing for Our Future, Space Age Technology Enabling Sustainable Fashion as part of London Climate Action Week. Uh, the intention for this week is to create a space for London's world leading array of climate professionals to come together to find solutions to climate change. As we know, climate change is a sy systemic challenge requiring all sectors and disciplines to work more closely together in order to develop and unleash innovative solutions. And it starts this week and it continues throughout the year. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about fashion and sustainability. And uh, fashion is the world's second most polluting industry. 60% of all clothing produced is thrown out within a year, either ending up in landfill or incineration. And that is, has a huge cost to the planet. And it's estimated that emissions from the sector will rise more than 60% by 2030. And by 2050, it will use up a quarter of the world's carbon budget. And these trends are continuing unless we do something about it. So I'm really excited to dig into this and, uh, and speak to these amazing panelists. And they're going to introduce themselves in a second. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before. So we're going to have time for Q&A at the end. So please do get those questions coming in through the chat. Uh, include your name in them so we'll know who to reference and we'll try to uh, answer as many of, of them as possible at the end. Um, so over to the panelists and uh, uh, if we start with you Sonia if you could explain just introduce yourself um, and why you're here your background and, and what you do please. Hello Damien thank you for that and before I start Kyle what an awesome tour it was great <laughs> actually see your operations and I'm with Damien I want to come to the London site when but in, in the time zone we can actually do that so hello everybody my name is Sonia Tamaya and I work at RB or Rekabek Kiza as Kyle calls us and I'm the head of sustainable brands and customer partnerships I'm absolutely delighted to be here today um, we are investors in Oxwash through Founders Factory and we're really keen to be part of this conversation in what's happening and then how together and collaboratively we can drive a more sustainable and safer system for fashion. Thank you, Sonia. Victoria, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here today. My name is Victoria Pruin. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company based in London called Her. Uh, we launched a couple of years ago as the UK's first peer-to-peer -peer wardrobe rental platform. So basically, we allow women to actually make money from their own wardrobe. Um, and we have users all across the UK who are making up to £1,000 a month actually monetizing their own clothes. Um, we exist because three and a bit years ago, um, I watched the boom of the sharing economy and the fact that there's a generation of people that don't want to own stuff. We, we rent our, uh, our houses, our cars, and, and I really believe that our wardrobes was the next step. Um, we all know, or I hope we are go we're all going to start knowing much more about sustainable fashion and the impact of fashion on the environment. So we really exist to extend the lifespan of the clothes we already own own um, and as a kind of step two we have a great pop-up in Selfridges and a great partnership with Selfridges who are now trialing their own rental platform through us and over lockdown we're now working with 40 plus brands exclusively rolling out their own rental platforms so it's a really interesting time a lot of a lot of turmoil for a lot of fashion brands and actually it's great that we can now provide a solution to them to oversupply past season stock and I'm very happy to talk about uh, more in depth about those kind of uh, partnerships we're, we're launching but it's a really interesting pivot and point in fashion where uh, innovation is really at the forefront and, and we're happy to be part of the selfages on, on that rental revolution too. And Kyle, for the one person on, on this, um, listening to this that doesn't know who you are, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Absolutely, and then you must too, Damien. So um, I'm Kyle, I'm the CEO of Oxwash, founded the business back when I was doing my PhD at the University of Oxford in synthetic biology and really got a passion for unsexy industries and giving them the innovation that they deserve. And that's really what we do here at Oxford is completely reinventing the way that laundry and dry cleaning is done with a business model that suits the modern world, hyper flexible, hyper reliable, and of course, responsible and sustainable as well. Um, and I'm Damien, I'm, uh, uh, I work for a business called Founders Factory, which is a corporate backed um, venture studio, i.e. we build companies, and accelerator program, i.e. we invest in companies. So in this role, I work with some fantastic entrepreneurs and founders and help them in the very early stages of their growth. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I worked with Kyle over the course of, uh, of this year and continue to do so. Um, and so I find myself in this very privileged position 
um, in, in the role that I have at the moment. But let's dig into it. So, Kyle, I think we'll go to you first, if, if that's okay. Um, so a big issue in the fight against climate change is the lack of consumer awareness. You know, it's a big problem, it's existential, um, and uh, uh, people often don't want to face up to it. Um, not many consumers would be aware of just how polluting their laundry cycle is. How did you become aware of it and what inspired you to fix it? Yeah, it's a great question. And actually, the lid for me got lifted the first time I ever went to visit a commercial laundry for the first time. When I started Oxwash, I actually did the laundry at home in my own machine with a delivery backpack, but very quickly got to the stage where that was no longer tenable. So partnered with a laundry just down the road from Oxford, where our HQ was at the time, and went in and saw a scene that really was reminiscent of a Victorian era sweat house, which was you know, pretty, pretty scary, vast amounts of water, chemistry, energy being used to get things clean, not to mention the amount of bleaches based on chlorine and things like that. You'd literally smell in your, in, in your nostrils and sting your eyes. And then the, the way that people were treated, you know, cash in hand under the books in these kind of industries is, is really scary. And I got a bee in my bonnet for finding out actually, you know, surely this is done better elsewhere. Turned out it wasn't the case and then made it my mission to go and see as many other laundries uh, around Europe and actually indeed in North America as well to see actually is this right for an innovation it really is and we're proud to be leading the charge in that regard one of the things that that struck me as um as very interesting was the was the, the sort of um the effluent waste from from the industry and and the impact that that has could you tell us a little bit about that yeah, absolutely. So traditionally, when you do laundry at home, or if you send it off to a service such as ourselves, vast amounts of chemistry are used and also drinking water straight out of the tap that really doesn't need to be drinkable. Your clothes and dry cleaning don't drink water like we do. So there are hundreds of litres of water that are sent down the drain with vast amounts of oxidative chemistry in them, phosphates and things like that as well, which provide and really endanger our water courses around the UK causing eutrophication, the oxygen in the water goes down, fish die, as well as the amount of microfibers that shed off of our clothes, especially those made of polyester, polyamides, and other synthetics like nylon. Those go down the drain, do not get filtered in sewage, uh, refuse, and reclamation plants, end up going back up the food chain into ourselves. And it's now been proven that most humans that get tested in their fat tissues for microfibers have them. And we really don't know the impact that that has on ourselves, so it's quite scary. Mm. Very, yeah, very serious thing that we need that um, needs to be addressed. And Victoria, so in the fashion world, um, as we as I mentioned, the problem is is quite different. In that conversations around fast fashion, unnecessary waste, and the impact that the industry has on the environment have been widely discussed for years, but um, recently it seems to, that that has reached a fever pitch. And I wonder why you think that is. Yeah, of course. Cool. So when we started her three and a bit years ago, I remember pitching the idea to some pretty, uh, you know, big fashion houses and e-com players. And they all said, actually, we don't think, we think fast fashion is always going to survive. Um, sustainable fashion is a trend, not a movement. And actually people don't care where their clothes for up come from. And three and a half years later, I think we're now at a stage where, you know, we've all seen fast fashion on the front of every newspaper and the horror stories that have come with some of it, those big exposés. Um, I think this is all part of, of, of the Gen Zs and the millennials who are definitely leading the charge in sustainability, I'd say, on uh, you know, at scale, who are looking, are asking questions, A, and are looking for cleverer, smarter ways to consume fashion. So for, for, for me and, and for the UK-wide consumer, I think there are two really interesting models. One is resale and one is rental. So on the resale side, we've seen the massive boom of Depop type models where, you know, the, the conversation around sustainable fashion just being for the elite or coming at a certain price point has slightly been debunked because actually you can buy a, a secondhand top for four pounds, five pounds, ten pounds. Um, and then re rental is a kind of slightly uh, newer model in the UK market that's trying to combat this A, massive issue of waste. Um, be the fact that, you know, do we need as many clothes in the world? So it's a really pivotal time where the customer is, is, is really wakening up. And, and to the question you asked, Kyle, about education, this comes down to education. So whilst we know that, that sustainable fashion and the waste and the impact of fashion, it has been long discussed and it's a problem that hasn't occurred overnight. Um, what we're interested in is sharing that and educating that to the UK-wide audience. Um, part of the reason I founded her is because I want to convert 
the fast fashion girl who is shopping on a fast fashion website every night or every couple of days for her outfit that weekend and convert her that renting or resale is a viable alternative. Um, so that's a lot of our focus um, at the moment is just educating in a way that doesn't feel elitist and exclusive in a way that is accessible because at the end of the day, um, we want to provide luxury fashion at fast fashion prices and that's the way that, that hopefully we can win. Yeah, I love that. Is, is, what, what are the sort of key messages that really resonate in that transition from, you know, moving somebody away from buying a, some fast fashion, very cheap clothing to more sustainable routes? So, I, uh, yeah, I'd say the biggest can, kind of barrier to entry that we have um, is actually how easy resale and renting is. Um, so I think people think, oh, renting, you know, it's, it's a bit of a faff. Is it, is, it, is it a difficult process? And actually, we, we've spent a long time and many years trying to make her look and feel like e-commerce, but obviously without the environmental impact. So it's really important to us that it looks elevated, that we Photoshop out the background of photos so that the consumer who's very used to e-com and online shopping day in, day out, actually feels like that's less of a daunting step um, and the kind of second part and the reason why kind of pre-lockdown and what, what we'll be launching back up hopefully early December actually having a physical bricks and mortar um, pop up in Selfridges has been absolutely crucial for us where our amazing install team can, can really handhold that customer and I mean all day every day and I do a lot of shifts and have done a lot of shifts shifts in the early lo early days of lockdown and recovering out of lockdown on on the shop floor and, and seeing those cogs go in that customer's head of, I don't have to spend 300 pounds on this dress. I can spend 50 pounds on it because I know statistically I'm going to wear it once anyway. Um, really drives home why why we do what we do and why <laughs> the mission is is so important because actually the moment that people are educated on why renting is as easy and as you know as elevated and you can get great pieces for a fraction of the retail price, um, it's a really easy sell for us. And Sonia, part, part of what we're doing here today is to help raise awareness of just how polluting our instilled behavior is. Um, what do you think the role of brands in encouraging consumers towards more sustainable choices um, are? What's their role? Thank you, Damien. Let, let me start here with a bit of context. So in RB, we sell approximately 20 million products every day. And this is through brands that many of you will know. Dettol, GRX, Finish, Harthek, and of course Vanish, the brand that's most closely associated to fashion, which is what we're talking about here today. What we've done in the last couple of years is we've gone through a real process to really understand you know, what is it that we want our brands to do? What are the roles that we want to play? And how do we use the scale that we have to really drive positive change? For example, one out of our three business units, we're in 400 million households. And that is a huge privilege. And with that privilege comes responsibility. And that's something we take really seriously. And when we look at that responsibility to really unpack what it means for our brands, we started with the best to-do list in the world. We started with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, And we said, okay, let's look at that as a problem that the world has to address by 2030. There's a ticking clock here. And yet, seeing as we're talking about climate change, I think that's something that we all really need to recognize. There's an urgency to the action that's actually needed to try and reduce some of those negative impacts and really try and uh, drive up the upside in a much, much greater way that, than we are at the moment. So for each of our brands, they've gone through this process to say, given what we do, given our profile, given our products, where can we really have a meaningful impact to drive positive change? How can we be authentic? How can we drive measurable positive outcomes? Which SDG is most relevant to us? And through that, we've defined a purpose, a mission, a fight, call it what you like. And this informs everything we do as a brand. It informs the innovation pipeline. It informs the partners we want to work with and critically also how we connect with consumers. So let's talk about this through Vanish and the lens of Vanish, seeing as that's to do with fashion. What does this really mean? So with Vanish, we have a mission to give clothes many lives. And of course our products have a huge role to play in this. And as a mother who very messy children, very happy, I should say, but messy, absolutely. And I embrace the dirt that comes with that. Um, yeah, I, I've come to love Vanish even more than I did before, frankly. Um, but we want to do a hell of a lot. We're on a mission, a bit like Victoria said, to really raise awareness with our consumers about the impact of fashion, but also to really inspire behaviors to change that in how people wear, care for, and also pass on clothes. So a lot of what we've been talking about already, and it's interesting because we talked about the whole lens and we said oh surely people know about this 
we did a piece of consumer research that showed there's still a relatively low level of awareness of the impact of fashion. Seeing as we're talking about climate, if you look at all the carbon emissions from the fashion sector, it's more than international flights and shipping combined globally. It's huge. And when you start with facts, science-based facts, to try and raise awareness of what it is, and also not just, um, not just to do it in a lecturery way or to scare people, but support it with ideas that are engaging and compelling, like what Victoria is doing, which is you know peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Look at the options instead of buying new, buy at least one piece of secondhand clothing. Yeah, what can we do in terms of our washing cycles? Redu yeah, washing at much reduced temperatures, thirty degrees instead of what you would normally. I think there's a real responsibility to think about the simple actions we can all take to really drive positive change. And if I look at Vanish, and we're in 82 million homes, we have a real responsibility to raise our voices with our partners to really drive that positive behavior change. It's really, and this is a question, I think, leading on from that, um, and, and to the to the entire panel, but we, you know, Sonia, you talked very well about how large brands with their enormous reach um, and, and the platform that that creates can help educate and shift consumer behavior towards more sustainable choices. My question for the panel is, what is the role for smaller enterprises, for startups um, in, you know, within this, uh, in, in order to address some of these challenges? Jump in, who would like to go first? <laughs> I, I can make a start. I can make a start. And, uh, I'm deeply, I'm going into the brave side. Um, so for me, what I love about startups like Oxwash is that they provide a fundamentally different business model than some of the bigger companies. And that's one of the reasons that we're delighted to partner with them. Um, and I think, you know, for consumers, it's having options. It's having options that bring that accessibility that Victoria talked about. This has to be something that's easy to do because we all have busy lives. So I think a startup has the agility as well as the innovation to bring some of those different ways of working, which are really compelling to consumers. I also think as well, just generally startups are able to execute extremely quickly. There's not those levels of, of decision-making and, and it means that you can turn things around and really react to the customer as quickly as possible. Um, you know, talking from a her point of view um, and rolling out Selfridges first ever rental platform rental platform where they are actually putting their their own stock available for rent it's a really interesting kind of example of okay we've we've tested this in real life and actually we now want to move that into our long-term business plan and rather than a lot of these brands that don't have the time capacity resource you know cost to build a resale platform or to build a rental platform i think it's a great you know time and moment for for, for larger companies to to access that tech or access that innovation that, that an Oxwash or a Her is doing, hopefully, um, and, and be part of that without having that massive commitment to build, which takes years. As we all know, there is massive urgency in solving our fashion problems, in being more sustainable, whether it's our dry cleaning um, or, or, or climate change on a whole. Um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a nice time where disruptive startups can actually partner with the bigger players um, if they are providing a solution that the larger brand sees value in. Yeah, and um, my two cents on this, and I couldn't agree um, with the two perspectives before, is that startups have a unique position in that you can build your mission and your business around that core focus that you want to attack, whereas for large institutional companies that have obviously been around for a long period of time, it's very hard to move the cruise ship in one direction or another and change your focus. Here at Oxwatch, we're striving to become a B Corp in the next couple of months, which we find it's a lot easier because we can build into place the policies, protocols, and missions and purposes that we need to be able to achieve that. Whereas I think that's much, much harder uh, for a big corporation to do in reverse. And also I think being a startup, it's our duty to make our services, products, and everything behavior completely aspirational to the point where people want to be associated with it and can really make a choice that makes them feel good. You know, nobody likes a purchase that makes you feel bad. And I think that there are some brands that have done this incredibly well that tap into a consumer's irrational want to be a good person and then backs that up, that's what you said, with the rational, it's on time, it works seamlessly, like Victoria said, with e-commerce. And I think it's a very exciting time to be able to start executing on those dreams. Mm -hmm. What, could you just, Carl, could you just tell us a little bit about what a B Corp is? 
That is a very good question. Um, so a B Corp is a new classification for a business that fulfills not only its normal corporate governance, but also at its core has both environmental and social um, benefits in mind, all the way to the point where in your articles of association for your business, you clearly state that this business is not just for profit, but it's for the planet as well. And there are lots of different facets of B Corps that allow people to shape their businesses into a way that support local communities, that reduce the amount of consumables that they use, reducing waste, but as well as supporting their team and in a completely wholesale um, kind of way is just more beneficial for our lives as employees attacking these goals that we've spoken about. Thanks. Um, Victoria, back to you. So we, we know that the, the fashion industry is um, by its nature, um, it has a circularity within it in terms of its seasonality and ever changing in terms of trends. Um, but how does that marry with your strategy of how you ensure that pieces um, stay relevant, um, pieces on your site stay relevant to consumers and, and it enables the circular economy to, to continue to go? Yeah, it's really interesting. So I'd say that there's definitely a percentage of our user base that is after that, that trend led piece, that Instagram piece that's blown up that they have been dying to get their hands on and, and want to rent it because they perhaps don't want to buy it. Um, and particularly sold out pieces. So those really cult status pieces do incredibly well on the platform. But in terms of our, our you know, UK wide customer, um, the vast majority of our customer base is much, much less focused on, on season. Um, we did a survey of, of our users um, and one of the questions was, what does S S and AW stand for and the vast majority have never heard of the terms spring, summer and autumn, winter and the fact that there are different collections for different times because our UK customer is, is not as tapped in. What, what they want is an amazing dress and rather than spending £300 on it, they're spending £30, £40, £50 pounds on it. Um, so I think in terms of how I see the fashion industry, I think we're going to see a massive shift away from this incessant you know, desire for newness that, you know, in, in the fast fashion world, there's nearly a trend or a new collection or season every week. Week. I mean, it's completely unsustainable. Um, and I think actually, you know, those seasonless pieces uh, need to be put at the forefront of fashion. So I'd say it's a fine balance. Um, how we kind of combat the issue is by having our just in section on our website full of nearly new new arrivals, which is what we call them where they are nearly new um, and actually having keeping that fresh. So we have, you know, probably about 100 items that go live and um, new, new arrivals, nearly new arrivals every day or every couple of days. So the consumer is kind of thinking that it's new, but actually, you know, these are pieces that we've found or brands we've signed or you know, pieces that have been listed organically. So I'd say there's a very fine balance um, between those cult status pieces that are listed organically and actually trying to think about what, this, what the fashion industry is going to look like in a couple of years. And, and my personal opinion is that we're going to have to move away from this incessant chasing of, of seasons. And the partnership that you've done with Selfridges is, 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 is brilliant. And it's great to see um, forward-thinking, established companies um, joining together with early stage businesses in order to solve these problems. Um, and my, my question on, on that for both you, Victoria, and, and you, Sonia, is um, how, how do we take this into the mainstream? How do we, you know, what, are the, what would you say to... Um, other established large-scale companies that are not there yet and what, what how should they be thinking? So, so I, I think it's a great question and I, I think this whole point about taking it to the mainstream, I, I think there's different elements to it um, and when you're taking it to the mainstream, I think you touched on one of those things which is about partnering with different people to really accelerate the change that we want to see. I'm a great believer. Some of the issues that we're talking about today, we as individual organizations cannot do on our own. Absolutely. Yeah, we recently announced a partnership with the British Fashion Council, where we're working with their Institute of Positive Fashion to get a science-based view around circularity of fashion across the value chain. You know, what are the different levers that we can push to really drive the change that we want to see, including looking at the consumer angle, which is something yeah, that we've been talking about today. Um, but for me, it's also about having a bit of humility, uh, recognizing the, the, the place that you have in the ecosystem in terms of driving that change um, and looking at the complementary parts of it that you need to build. And there's something about having a messaging that really resonates. And it's not about doing it once because that big splash 
you have a big, huge noise for a bit, but then it dies. It's about reinforcing the messages, keeping it fresh, giving a continuous stream of options which consumers want to buy into, which is, I think, going to change things on an ongoing basis over time and lead to the much bigger impact that we need to see. I'd also completely um, uh, agree with that, I think, for us. Um, you know, rental, I think, can be seen as a bit of a tick box, you know, okay, great, we need to do a bit of CSR because we're not an inherently sustainable brand. Can we take a box and launch a resale platform or a rental platform? And um, for me, you know, uh, having a department store as innovative itself, which is kind of back rental as an idea, um, it is great, but actually what, what will stand the test of time and what proves value is actually when you're incorporated into their long-term business strategy, which we are now going through that process by, by them launching their own collection and hopefully adding product you know, every couple of weeks, months, quarter, um, to keep that offering fresh. Um, the, the, the real key is, is moving from a tick box to a viable revenue stream. The moment that we can prove to a brand that the return is as viable as the and buying wholesale or sell, selling it to the consumer um, it's going to take time but it's actually it's got to be financially viable as well rather than just a tick box and I think sustainability particularly for big brands um, is seen as a as a cost it's seen as a oh we've got to do this because you know we, we need to and we should um, and actually you know our, our big sale is actually give us a dress we need to rent it only a couple of times to have made that wholesale value back and everything else is pure profit. Um, and, and we've now got enough data and case studies to prove that. So I think, you know, it's all about making sure that it's not just a tick box and actually it is viable as well. Mm. I think Victoria, that's can, I, can, I, can I add to that, Damien? Because I, I, think, I think Victoria made a really good point there. And I actually think, I worked in the field of sustainability for over 20 years and I've seen the conversation change quite substantially over that time started off with a very compliance-based conversation, then it moved to a risk-based conversation. But I think now where we're at is it is, it is absolutely by the opportunity. So yeah, couldn't agree with you more, which is yeah, doing the right thing is seen as a driver of growth for a business. And for a company like us, for RB, the reason we are purpose-led, the reason that we really think about the impact we want to have on society through our brands is because it's absolutely gonna drive value for us as a business. Yeah, we, we see that the world is changing and we want to play our role in it, but we also, we, we're not a charity, we're not an NGO. We absolutely see the commercial value in looking at the impact that we can have through our brands, through our products, through our wider footprint, um, and making that happen in reality rather than just talking about it. That's something which I think is really important, which is to move beyond the rhetoric to real action. Yeah, I think that that is absolutely essential. And, you know, and, and I... I think I applaud RB with repositioning, well, with positioning some, um, some, of the, some of the brands from home and personal care around sustainable development goals and purpose-led initiatives and in categories that, that grow or decline, you know, a couple of percentage points annually, seeing a 10x improvement on that over the course of a few years. Um, not only, you know, as you said, not only does the right thing for the sustainable um, the drive to sustainability, but also um, enables it to be sort of self-liquidating so that those initiatives can continue to happen. Um, I think that, that that is absolutely critical. So um, I've got a couple more questions before we're going to take some from the audience. So please do remember to get uh, anything that's burning um, into the Q&A panel and, uh, and we will address that in a second. But Kyle, one for you. So as well as educating consumers, many companies are now taking a look um, internally to reduce their impact at a process level, something which is at the heart of both the HER and Oxwash operations. How important do you think um, sustainability, uh, not just a part of the company, but sort of instilled in the fabric of how it operates? Yeah, this is one that we really boil down to two words, and that's unit economics. And our process, Tom and I as engineers, we really interrogate each part of the collection of our customers' items, the washing, the drying, the pressing, re-delivery, and also then for many customers, the repeating of that process. And when you step back and you interrogate the whole system as, as one, you're able to see where your bottlenecks are, where your inefficiencies are. We've weaved software through that whole process so that we can analyze in real time you know, where or where not we need to put and press, but press buttons to alleviate those problems. And what that enables us to do is by coupling efficiency with the use of overheads, water, chemistry, energy, 
is we're able to improve our unit economics to the point where for every load of washing that we do, it's up to 65% less water energy chemistry than you can even do at home. And that means that not only is it better for the environment, but also we save money because chemistry, energy and water gets expensive at scale. So it really is a point around driving efficiency, not only for your business's growth, but your unit economics then allow you to, to grow sustainably financially as well. Is that a difficult thing for um, established organizations to go through and repurpose how they process and you know their, their internal processes? Obviously, building it from the ground up, I assume, you know, um, there is an intention there, but how do you think about how more established businesses could do that? Yeah, that, that is a tricky one. And I think that lots of startups now are actually becoming the platform to allow this to happen. So one of my very good friends, Will, and his company, InfoGrid, developed these small tiles that look like Scrabble pieces that can sense things like a machine being operated, water usage, temperature, that kind of thing. And they are instilled throughout the whole of a process and digitize that very tangible, like atom-based process into the bits of software and data. And that allows you to weave software through an existing process, make real gains with the process you already have, and then elucidates and reveals points where perhaps you would like to invest a lot of capital and time to remove that roadblock. So I think that by using startups to actually improve existing pipelines is very real. And those platforms are incredible. Interesting. Um, and then a question for, for all, of, all of you. What, what are the things that we can do as consumers to help address this, these damaging cycles? Shall I go to, uh, to get my two bits in before the, uh, the other guys get some real, real meat on the bone? Um, my feeling is very strongly that we don't need, you know, 100,000 people consuming perfectly. We need several million people, especially in the UK and across the globe, consuming responsibly, but imperfectly. I think it's not a problem to put your hand up and be like, look, I'm doing my best, but I'm not getting it absolutely right. And as, as we've mentioned already, even just rebuying one item of clothing can be that kick that starts the flywheel of change, not only for you personally, but for those around you, especially in your households, raising a family with those new um, kind of values instilled within your family can then pass that on to the next generation more naturally. Um, and I think that what, what we do here at Oxwash is we say we're still not perfect, not by a long shot, but we know exactly what we want to do to achieve the net zero impact in the future. And we're doggedly pursuing that. So I think intention is often much more powerful than execution in the short term. So to, if I can add to that, so from a consumer standpoint, uh, I would agree with Carl said, you know, people have busy lives, there's a lot going on, and there's actually a lot of information out there. And sometimes that can be confusing, because that adds to the noise to say, what is the more sustainable choice? Which is the better path? What is it that I should do? And, and my suggestion is, rather than try and boil the ocean, pick the one thing that you want to do differently, and pick the thing that you're passionate about, that's important to you, that's really going to move the needle. And don't think of it as a burden. Think about it as something that you really want to do and is going to excite you. Be that buying one piece of secondhand clothing. Uh, be that thinking about energy in your house. Think about my big one, sorry, Damien, talking about some of the things we've done with our brands. And if I don't say it, uh, I'll, I'm going to be shot by someone, which is it with finish. We talk about skip the pre-rinse. Don't pre-rinse before you put your dishes in the dishwasher and that can save shed loads of water. So yeah, pick that one thing that you're going to do differently and change it up change it up through the year so it doesn't become a burden it becomes something that's interesting but drives real change um in terms of our environmental footprint and, and i love what you said about the next generation um i have two kids eight and six and actually the next generation give me a lot of hope because i i look at the conversations we have around climate change around plastic around water and they're real advocates they're real little gretas and i'm so proud of that um, and they're not, they're not alone, frankly. So I, it gives me real hope for the next generation. So I, I am hopeful about the change that we will see. Um, and finally, I think from a fashion point of view, um, for us, um, it, it's sharing a very clear message of 
quality over quantity and actually rather than buying 10 fast fashion dresses, investing in one, actually seeing it as an investment and knowing that it has some monetary value as well. So, you know, we already have some super, super savvy people that use our platform where they are investing in one item and, and we can prove um, that, that they're choosing to invest in one item rather than lots of fast fashion items. Um, and I think there are a few really simple things. Um, so Livia Firth, who is a big sustainable fashion advocate in our space, has something very simple called the 30 wears rule. If you don't think you're going to wear an item 30 times, um, don't buy it. Um, and then on a more personal level, um, some really easy things to incorporate into our everyday life. Um, you know, we're pushed into our into our inbox, you know, new, you can't live without this item. Your life's not going to be great unless you own this, you know, item, whatever it is. Um, and, and, and a few really simple things from me, you know, I, I screenshot an item every time it comes into my inbox. Um, I'll keep it on my phone if I still like it in a month or a couple of months then I'll consider purchasing it. Yes, I could miss out, but I'm sure I can live without it. Um, and I think just generally being a bit smarter about, you know, don't buy a summer dress. If you can't wear it all year round, just rent it. A few really, really simple things. Um, and we try and debunk all those myths because sustainability is still very confusing. Um, so, so I think just really, really to know, to explain to the consumer that this actually is very simple. It's about owning less, accessing what we need and just being a bit savvier about not consuming things for, for the sake of consuming them. Great. Oh, I'm just getting a note from my producer. He tells me we've got some breaking news just in about a partnership between her and Oxford. So my question to Kyle and Victoria, how did this partnership form? What is it? And what made the two brands a, a great, a good fit? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Damien. <laughs> that, that, that was, was brilliant. That was very well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just go from, from uh, Oxwash's point of view very quickly. So we, we know full well that we own the kind of washing space and we want to become incredibly good at washing items with as little environmental impact as possible. But we really want to bring to our consumers and to the wider world more impact. And to do that, we kind of got in touch with Victoria actually this summer and really idolized the change in consumer behavior that her is bringing to not only our customers, but also the wider UK population. And what we felt like is we, we absolutely have to be there behind the scenes, supporting them in their challenge and their idols for us. And we completely buy into their mission. And we're very, very proud to be the pipeline that they are using for washing all of their rental items moving forwards. And obviously now in the time of COVID, that's incredibly important to get right when you're sharing items the hygiene and disinfection that we've achieved to you know greater than healthcare levels we think is really really powerful to make sure that the her items going out into the wild are safe to wear again and again and again so we're very very excited and super proud to be working with her moving forwards Love that, Damien. Yes, so um, uh, this today marks the first day of our uh, formal launch with, with Oxwash, so it's been months in the planning. Um, for us, dry cleaning is, is a massive pain point, or, well, until now, has been a pain point in our model, um, where um, if you take Rent the Runway, who are the biggest player in the, in the US market for rentals, they run the biggest dry cleaning facility in the whole of the United States. So they're very much in a logistics operation and dry cleaning business as much as they are a front-end fashion company. Um, and for over three years I have tried to find a great solution to our dry cleaning you know problems uh, we've tried every single which way every single which provider um, and I remember seeing the tech crunch uh, Google alert about Oxwatch raising money and, and what they were doing um, and we had to make it work for us so um, going forward all her um, I've just seen a question come through about all selfages garments rental clean by Oxwash the answer is yes so um, all the items in our selfages pop up when we relaunch um, and this has been the case for, for the majority of this year, um, have a great little um, label in them that says this, this item's been dry cleaned to space age technology that's used by leading healthcare industries too. Um, and it's the most important part of our business. There's no point running a rental business that uses perk or uses horrendous chemicals in their dry cleaning. Um, so going forward, um, it's a massive relief that I have found someone uh, like Kyle and a company like Ox Oxwash because they solve a massive pain point and means we can now get back to doing what we do better um, and scaling throughout the UK with our dry cleaning in hand. Great. Sounds like a match made in heaven. And, and uh, <laughs> if that is not in the spirit of London Climate Action Week, I don't know what is. Really, really well uh, applauded for, for that initiative. 
So we've got some questions here, um, and I think we are going to start. We'll stay. We'll stay with you, Victoria. Um, we've got a question here from Gemma. Um, what does the future of rental look like? Uh, Gemma runs a sustainable platform and believes that rental is the future. I'm glad to hear it. Um, so uh, future of rental, big question. Um, I'd say for us, um, this is about educating everyone that what they need to invest in. The UK consumer needs to invest in a capsule wardrobe. That's their white t-shirts, their cashmere jumpers, their jeans that they are wearing all day, every day. Everything else should and can be rented. Um, we have built her uh, not just to be an occasion wear business so I think when people think of rental they think oh yes when I when I've got Ascot or when I've got Henley or when I've got a wedding um, we of course facilitate all those rentals and, and rental leans itself towards those kind of uh, moments and occasions but our business is built around those we call the mini moments um, and the elevated every day so this is uh, you know your date night the picnic in the park the dinner party the 30th birthday those those events those mini events that are happening all the time um, so for me the future of rental is just all about that capsule wardrobe getting that right and everything else whether it's a blouse a bag a coat ski wear whatever it is can be rented very cool. And, and Sonia, I've got one for you here from anonymous attendee, but I don't think that's their real name. Um, I'd love to learn more about RB's long term sustainability strategy and the lessons startups such as her and Oxwash can learn from a large company of, of your size. Thank you, Damien, and hello, Anonymous. Um, so in terms of our long term strategy, your timing is perfect. So in RB, we've had a sustainability strategy since 2012. And like a lot of big corporates, we've had targets up to 2020. We are now in the process of refreshing that, given so many of the changes that we've seen, and setting a forward-looking strategy with targets to 2030 and even beyond to 2040. Um, and just to give you a preview of some of it, um, uh, this is stuff that's already out there. This year, we announced our new climate change targets. So we committed to science-based targets, um, to align with the 1.5 degree centigrade trajectory, which is a high level of ambition because others are looking at two degrees. Um, and that means that we'll have a 65% reduction in our carbon emissions in our operations by 2030. We also want to be to want to have 100% renewable electricity across our operations by 2030. And ambitiously, we also want to be carbon neutral by 2040. So in the climate space, that is very much our targets. However, for us as RB, I think what's really important with the sustainability strategy is, is that it shouldn't actually be a sustainability strategy. It should be our business strategy. It should be something that sits in the core of our business um, and something that drives that growth that we're talking about. Now, if I look at what we do across hygiene, health, and nutrition, one of the things that we can't escape is that increasingly the connection between environmental issues like climate change and the loss of biodiversity are leading to real healthcare and hygiene issues. So COVID is a fantastic example of that. Um, so for us as a business, we look at what we do uh, through our brands and through our footprint. And then we look at the sustainability dimension of it. And we build a strategy with sustainability at the core of it. So it's not something that sits to the side of the business, but it's something that's very much part of what our supply teams do in manufacturing, what our brand teams do in terms of innovation, what our R&D teams do. Uh, what our procurement teams do in terms of working with our suppliers to drive more of the sustainable options. So, yeah, and this is linked to the second part, which is what are the lessons? My biggest lesson is sustainability should not be something that's to the side of the business. A bit like with Oxwash, and the reason why I love it so much as a model is, it's very much at the heart of what you do as a business and it should drive the business outcomes that you want to have. And the second thing I would say is, a lot of people talk sustainability, but I really encourage startups and smaller companies also to have actions. And it sounds a bit dull, but it, it is about measurement and targets. Set yourself ambitious targets and work towards delivering them. So then you've actually got some numbers and something to sit behind your narrative in terms of what it is that you're actually doing. And then Kyle, I've got some, a question here from Jenny. Um, I'm hoping that Oxwash will soon come to Brighton because I need them for my cleaning items that really need stain removal. When are you going to Brighton? You're also on mute. I was just saying not soon enough for Jenny. Um, well, part of our expansion model over the next few years is obviously rolling out across the UK to bring our service to more of the UK population. And Tom, our COO, is working on a very, very cool model on how to do that. 
obviously being a business that has a lot of atoms, a lot of stuff, it's pretty hard to grow quite quickly. So we are thinking inside the box, wink, wink, about a cool strategy that hopefully we'll be able to share this time next year at LCAW 2021. Oh, I, I, the suspense. <laughs> Very cool. Um, okay, what, I think we'll do one last question, and this is, this is for everybody here. Um, this comes from Alex. And what can we do to, to change our relationship with our clothes so that we value and appreciate the items that we own? Um, through the rise of fast fashion, we seem to have lost some of that appreciation. Yeah, I've got one quick one on this. And I think that actually it comes down to get involved in the care for the item yourself. We built a business on doing that for consumers, but there are many things that you can do at home. You know, if a button falls off, don't just throw it away. You know, go on YouTube and find out how do I sew a button back on? You know, looking after your clothes not only extends their lifetimes out, but also gives us a real kick and, hey, I'm doing my bit and now I can sew. That's a great thing that I learned pretty recently. And now I use it all the time and sew buttons on everything pointlessly. But I think just doing some bits at home. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, I also think that this connection, um, I couldn't agree more, we, we've got no affiliation with the people that have been making our clothes and there's there's such a long chain between the person manufacturing the item and the person buying the item, you know, how many people sat on this call uh, that are participating in this in this Zoom know the item that they're wearing and who, who, who made it, where did it come from, where was it manufactured, what was the CO2 impact of importing it from China because it probably was. Um, this probably isn't a good example because it's secondhand, so I don't know where this exact item came from, but I started asking a lot more questions. And um, the trends we're seeing in, in the fashion industry generally are kind of made to measure, made to order fashion. Um, I see that as a massive boom area. I personally just had my first ever dress made that arrived two days ago, and it's given me more joy than any purchase I've probably made in a couple of years. I even came with a personalized note. Um, so I think that that's a massive, a, a massive trend that I hope will continue. Um, and then I think just asking questions. So so before you shop a brand, DM them. I, I, I'm probably that annoying consumer who's asking, you know, on Instagram, who's making that item? You know, where, where are they based? What are they paid? Um, the more questions the consumer asks at the end of the day, the consumer, every pound they spend, they're, ch the vote, they're, vote, they're choosing that vote, aren't they? They're, they're choosing which companies they back. And um, so I would just, you know, query, you know, try and connect with the clothes and connect with the people behind those clothes by asking as many questions as possible. And if a brand doesn't respond or you're not happy with the response, maybe that's the point where you consider you reconsider your purchase. So, so if I think about connecting to clothes, I, I think it's an excellent point. I think the whole rise of fast fashion is because it's too easy and too cheap to get something that's a three pound t-shirt. If something costs you three pounds, there's a reason for it and you need to think about it. Um, but also, let's not stand on our pedestals, there, there, there are people who need those three pound t-shirts as well. So yeah, it is about, I think for me, asking the right questions. When you look at a piece of clothing, if you're buying a new piece of clothing, thinking about, do I need it? Uh, is this something that's going to bring me joy? Because actually clothing should be joyful. So I, I don't want to take that away from it. Um, is this something that I'm going to use on a regular basis? And if I'm not, how do I, how, how do I balance that off in terms of sharing it? or looking at it through different lenses. I think what's amazing at the moment is that there are a lot of options in terms of how you can think about clothes, but absolutely recognizing the wider impact that sits behind that t-shirt, that sits behind that dress is really important. And it's about valuing it a lot more and appreciating it, appreciating it when you do wear it. And just seeing that wider chain that sits behind whatever it is that you decide to buy, share or sell on. That was great. Well, I think, we will leave it there, but that was a, an illuminating, fascinating discussion. Um, and, and I really, really appreciate uh, Victoria, Sonia and Kyle uh, for giving us their thoughts um, and, and to everyone that asked questions and, and everyone that tuned in for that. So on behalf of everybody here, on behalf of RB, on behalf of her, on behalf of Oxwash, and of course on behalf of Fantasy Factory, thank you. And uh, hopefully we will check in with you um, uh, you know, in the future. If you want to get in touch with any uh, anyone and follow up the conversation, um, please email Kyle, K-Y-L-E, at oxwash.com, um, and he will be able to uh, respond to thousands of emails over the next <laughs> few days um, and, uh, and pass, pass on uh, contacts as, uh, as needed. Um, but brilliant. Thank you so much, everybody, and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank, Thank you, you Damien. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.